Hello and welcome to this SimScale tutorial series. These videos are designed to introduce you to simulation through the SimScale platform and to get you started into engineering simulation as quickly as possible. But first, what actually is engineering simulation? Simply put, it's the analysis of a design in a virtual environment. It allows us to test different designs and make design decisions without having to test or even make the actual object. We can create the laws of physics on our computer and apply them to our design to see how it would perform in the real world. Be it a crane holding a heavy weight and we're trying to see if it would collapse, or the flow of air through a jet engine and we're looking at how much air is sucked into the engine. A lot of things can be simulated from many different disciplines of engineering. It is rarely necessary to apply all the laws of physics to a problem, so usually we apply the laws or mathematical equations we know are important for our design. The main areas would be fluid flow, structural analysis, thermal or heat propagation, and electromagnetic interactions. Simulation is used to test designs from all areas of engineering, but it also extends beyond engineering. Have you ever wondered how the waves around boats in movies like Titanic look so real? Or how the water ripples look so real in a video game? That's all simulation. If we take an example, imagine a river where you place a wireframe cube somewhere in the river. Water can freely pass through this cube. Now imagine we inject ink at some point upstream of the cube, as shown in the picture. We can ask ourselves the question, how can the amount of ink inside the cube change? Let's try to think of all the ways this can happen. Most obviously, the ink can move in the river and maybe pass through one of the sides of the cube. That would definitely change the amount of ink within the cube. It would make the total amount of ink in there go up, right? The same but opposite is also true. Ink which has gotten into the cube can also leave through the sides of the cube. Okay, but how else can ink enter the cube? Well, if we inject ink straight into the cube, or maybe, just to be thorough, a chemical reaction in the river can somehow happen and ink is created or destroyed within the cube. These are the only two ways the amount of ink inside the cube can change. If it moves through the surfaces of the cube, or if it is created or destroyed inside the cube. So maybe we can form a basic equation. The amount of ink going through the surfaces, plus the amount of ink created or destroyed within the cube, will give us the change in the amount of ink within the cube. So if I inject a litre of ink upstream, and half of that, say, enters the cube, half a litre, but I also inject half a litre directly into the cube, the amount of ink inside the cube has gone up by a litre. That's what our equation can give us. Let's add a few more cubes for a second and say that no chemical reactions are occurring and we aren't injecting any more ink, so no creation or destruction is going on. We place cubes around that first one. If ink leaves our old cube, it has to enter one of the other cubes, right? There's no creation or destruction, ink doesn't magically disappear. If the amount of ink in our original cube goes down, it must go up in another cube, probably the one just after it. The ink is transported between the cubes. If we cover the river in cubes, the overall amount of ink stored within the river and all the cubes won't go up or down. The total amount of ink is conserved. So although the ink can move between the cubes, the total amount of ink remains the same. The maths behind the different laws of physics that I mentioned earlier are written to conserve some quantity, like the ink. Make sure the total amount of it doesn't change within some space, just like conserving the total amount of ink in the river. For example, physics likes to conserve things like mass, momentum, and energy. It likes to conserve mass because if I place my water bottle on a kitchen weighing scales, I expect it to give me the same weight today as it did yesterday, unless I drank some of the water. And this will always be true, barring some nuclear mishap with my water bottle. Similarly, momentum is conserved. Conservation of momentum can be seen when you hit a billiard ball together. You can predict where they'll move, 
Whether you're good at that prediction is a different story. But ultimately, the underlying principle in this collision is the conservation of momentum. The total amount of momentum contained by both balls will not change. This is true for everything, even things like water. If we point two pipes of water at each other, it will create a spray that conserves momentum. So we had our cubes arranged such that we could conserve the amount of ink in the river by looking at how much ink is passing through the cube surfaces. Can we apply the same concept to things other than ink? Can the cubes also conserve things like momentum and mass? Yes, they can. Okay, so now let's look at this applied in a simulation setting. We'll take the example of a pipe as shown on the right here. It has water entering in two places and exiting in one place. First, we'll break it down into a bunch of little cubes like we did with the river, and then we'll tell the computer where we want water to enter and exit. Then after that, we'll make sure the amount of mass passing through our cube sides is balanced, and then we'll make sure the amount of momentum passing through the cube sides is balanced. And we'll do this for all the cubes. A brief note, we call this step of breaking the pipe into cubes meshing, and we call the balancing steps solving. After these steps, we can take a look at our simulation results. Okay, so first, looking down the center of the pipe, we break it into a bunch of little cubes. Then, we tell the computer where water is entering or leaving. These areas, called boundaries, are the only place where creation or destruction is happening, if you remember from the ink example. Then, we balance our mass and momentum for each cube. This could take forever to do for all cubes by hand, so we'll let the computer handle this step. Then we can take a look at our results. We'll hop onto the SimScale platform, which you'll learn all about how to use in the following videos. So here we can see the cubes along the center of the pipe, like we had before. Water is entering from here and here, while leaving at this point here. For each of these cubes, the computer has balanced mass and momentum to find out what overall direction the water is moving in. Let's take a look at what the computer has calculated. Here we can see the water directions for the different cubes which were balanced. Now the nice thing about being on a computer is that instead of looking at arrows to understand how fast the water is moving, we can use colour. In this case, the redder the colour, the faster the water. The bluer the colour, the slower the water. So back to our original question, what is engineering simulation? In a general sense, it's breaking down a problem into little chunks, cubes in our case, and writing our laws of physics in a way that can be applied to each chunk. Then we let the computer solve these laws of physics in each chunk. This route of breaking down the problem into manageable chunks is much easier than trying to create one equation that can be applied to the entire system at once. These equations that are applied to the chunks generally take the form of partial differential equations. So you could say engineering simulation seeks to solve the equations which govern the laws of physics for your design. And with that, are you ready to start your simulation journey?